fifth episode of Life, Love and the Pursuit of F.I. We are lucky to be able to introduce Michael Zuber, who is the author of One Rental at a Time, The Path to Financial Independence Through Real Estate Investing. Hey, thanks for joining us tonight, Michael. How are you? I'm doing well, man. That's uh, that's a sexy voice right there, I tell you. <laughs> yeah, we, we have Alexa on standby just for that. <laughs> oh, very nice, very nice. Yeah. Now we just need a real woman. To do it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, what was it like when you were first writing your book? Did you experience any like challenges when you were writing it? Yeah. Well, the first thing about writing the book was uh, I didn't actually start out to write a book per se. Right. What? So my, my story goes basically: I show up to work one day excited about the next year because I was in sales. We live on a yearly calendar. And the short story is a lot of things changed and I wasn't happy about it. So uh, decided to part ways from the company I was at. So then I come home, right? I, I'm 45 years old. I go to work thinking I'm going to work again. And I come home like, honey, I'm coming home. And um, the next two days I spend probably like everybody calling everybody they know saying they're retired, right? It's the only time I ever exhausted my phone and my, uh, my address book. And um, once that happened, I didn't know what else to do because I'm very type A, very motivated. So a couple of weeks go by guys and I'm starting to get depressed, like seriously depressed. Like I'm 45, don't have to work, bills are paid, but I'm not, I don't feel like I'm accomplishing anything. I just, I still wake up at 6 a.m. I look at my market a couple times a day but I'm not doing anything. So like two weekends before, like the third weekend, I, um, I'm i like, if, if I don't get out of this headspace, I'm gonna go back to work. And, and I would feel like a failure, right? You build a portfolio up over 15 years, you can financially retire, but your mind doesn't let you. So what I told myself is I'm gonna finally write the book, right? So I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad to get started, but it doesn't tell you how to how to do anything. It's just kind of a, vocabulary book, a mindset book, a little bit of a book on accounting. So I wrote one rental at a time for myself. As I said in the book, one of my greatest regrets is I didn't document the journey, right? You don't know what I would pay today, It'd be thousands of dollars, if I could have a picture of me at 30 in front of my first house and 31 in my second house, 33 in my third house, right? I can't have that because I didn't take the time to, to celebrate. So. Writing what became one rental at a time was just a way for me to forgive myself and really revisit what turned out to be a pretty good time. It was a crazy market, a crash. It, lot, there's lots of twists and turns, but um, yeah, so I write it. It's just a PDF at the time. I send it out to a dozen or 20 people and like, I don't know what you're doing. Finish this book, get it out there because people need to read it. So, um, so I finish it. I get it edited by a couple of New York editors and there you go. So I wrote it for myself, but I'm glad others like it now. That's awesome. Were, were you always were you always into real estate? Like, was that a big part of your portfolio? Uh, well, it, so the answer is no, right? So I'm like probably most people out there, go to school, get a good job, make a lot of money. That was my stick, right? So I got a, I got a four-year degree in economics, and then I got a master's degree in I was a hard charging sales guy making six figures by the time I was 26 and I was spending it all. Uh, then about uh, 29, probably 29 or so, I start trading stocks. Uh, I turn a whopping seven grand into 200 grand about over 18 months. So I'm flexing. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling like I'm Warren Buffett with 200 grand in the bank and, and not even 30. <laughs> and uh, lo and behold, the market taught me a lesson, much like it is doing right now to others. That 200 grand I lost 80% of it uh, in about a short six or seven week period. And suddenly you go from feeling like Warren Buffett to the stupidest person on the planet. So I didn't even find real estate till after I was 30. And I found it because I was depressed and I walked through a bookstore. I was like, God, what? stocks is not your thing. Uh, so what are you going to do to have a better future? And that's where I found the purple book that's called Rich Dad Poor Dad. Are you still currently investing in real estate? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I tr I've been buying, I think I did six deals last year. Yeah. I, yeah. The beauty about real estate is it's not age specific. And once you build a network and you learn your market, uh, you can always do deals. So uh, yeah, I did six deals last year. I refinanced a bunch of debt when rates were lower. 
so yeah, I, I plan to I plan to do a lot more this year. How many doors are you up to now? I think after selling some apartments and adding some more last year, I think we're one seventy seven, might be one seventy six, something like that. Nice. Now is it mostly apartment buildings, or do you still have some single family? No, well, I mean, on the unit count for sure, um, we're probably it's in. I mean, there, some of the numbers are in the book. I would, I'm just going to guess thirty five single family homes. 50 units, kind of duplex through quads, right, which is still residential, and then the rest uh, apartments. And just to be clear, right, I, I only talk about what I've done, and, and we've bought five through 20 units. We've never done anything bigger than 20 units. So uh, that would be the rest. Did you, uh, did you invest during the crash of 2008? Yeah, like we talk about in the book, right? So, and I wish I could tell you I saw it coming because I'd have made a lot more money. Uh, but we started buying in 02, right? You can actually go up on Zillow and look at my first purchase was 1818 North Drive East, 93703. We bought it for 107. I think it was like December 17th, 2002. We start buying one house and then we bought another house the next year and another house the next year. We get to about 2006 and we have eight units, um, six houses in a duplex, if I remember right. And we're trying to buy the ninth one. And nothing makes sense. I mean, 2006 is bananas. Like that house on Norris Drive, which I buy for 107, rents for 1100, ultimately sells for 265 or 267. But the rent never changed. So while it was positive cash flow, a couple hundred bucks at 100 grand, it's wildly negative at 260 or 270 or whatever it was. That was the market I was trying to buy the ninth house in. And my brain, my financial brain, wouldn't let me buy negative cash flow, which I call alligator in the book. So we go to a real estate meetup and we see the guy on stage and the guy on stage shows, you know, at the time you shouldn't be, you know, probably want to be houses, everybody wants them. Why don't you guys look at apartments? And I remember talking to him after the event and I said, hey, that's cute that you say buy apartments, but you know, we're not millionaires. And I think that's very <laughs> disingenuous. And I remember he put his hand around my shoulder. He's like, oh, Michael. He says, go look for five to 10 unit buildings. Again, I didn't know, man. I didn't know those things existed. Nobody in my family had ever done in real estate. Nobody in my family ever owned a rental. I, I didn't know. It wasn't in Rich Dad Poor Dad. So what the heck do I know, right? And uh, sure enough, we find a five unit building that we bought. We actually did a 1031 exchange. We talk about that a lot in the book. So we sell North Drive, we buy a five, four, five place. We sell this, we buy 13. We sell this, we buy 10. So we 1031 out right before the crash. So when the crash happens and it crushes residential real estate, we are nowhere to be found. We do not have a single residential property. Apartments go down. It's, like, it's not like they were safe. Uh, but again, I spend cash flow. I don't spend equity. And that's the big thing that people don't realize. A lot of people talk about betting on appreciation. I've never done that. I don't believe in it. I believe in cash flow. Cash flow pays my bills. Cash flow allows me to act like every day is Saturday. Um, so yeah, that's uh, we 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 did escape it. I wish I could tell you I saw it coming. I just uh, all I know is we couldn't buy the ninth property, and I had to do something else. So so we did. How did you get funding for the first deal that you did for apartments? Uh, we did a 1031 exchange. We okay. sold Norris Drive. We we walked away with, I don't know, $105,000 or $110,000. We just 1031 that into apartment. So no new money. With your first property, the mm -hmm. uh, Norris Drive, yep. how much of a hurdle was it, like a mindset hurdle, getting the money for that property? So I know in the book you mentioned doing mm -hmm. like 401k loans and stuff like oh, yeah. that. But yeah. like, I feel like that's like a big, like mental thing to overcome, like to trust and believe that it'll work out risking like your <laughs> retirement funds like that. <laughs> yeah. So we, we started taking from our 401k, like the fourth or fifth property. So that first, the first couple of properties, remember how I went from seven to 200 and then we lost 80%. So we still had 40K left. That's the money we used for North Drive and then in, in another property, just in fairness. Uh, but yeah, borrowing from a 401k. Um, I actually thought it was pretty cheap money. I, I, didn't, I didn't have faith in the stock market at all. I still don't. Uh, but my company matched. I don't remember exactly, but let's say they matched eight grand. 
So I figure, hey, if I donate eight and you donate eight, that's 16 grand. It's 100% gain. And then, oh, by the way, I can go get a 50% loan and I get my 8K back. For, to me, it was a no-brainer. Um, it was really no risk. And then, of course, I paid myself back every paycheck. And Dude, I, I borrowed from my 401k probably six, eight, ten times. It, it, I, a lot of the real estate I own is because of 401k loans. Okay, so what has like your journey and your life been consisted of since you released the book? Uh, first off, really helping people understand it's possible. There's nothing that Olivia, our, our journey to financial independence is really what most full-time employees sh should believe. First, we got religious and lived below our means, right? Financial independence is a journey. I believe everybody can do it in 10 years if they're committed. But it starts with living below your means so you can stack paper and save. Uh, nowadays, you can build a side, side hustle and stack faster, right? Get that income snowball. And we sacrificed for 10 years. We didn't do anything nice. We didn't do any extras. I talk about needs and wants all the time. Our needs were met. We had food. We had gas. We, we had the clothes we needed. So it's not like we were you know, living in our cars or something. But we had no extras. Everything we had extra went to the next rental property. Um, and then we just kept moving. We, we kept looking at our market. Uh, you know, the market crashes. We, we start buying private money because people know what we're doing. Uh, but yeah, our stories, you know, the book, the book was 15 years from start to finish. It's, it's tough to replace two six figure incomes. Um, if you've ever played Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow games, it is far easier to get out of the rat race as a policeman or a teacher than it is a doctor or a lawyer. Uh, and it's true in life as well. Yeah, absolutely. I agree full heartedly. Um, are you planning on doing another book? I actually just released my second book, 15 Conversations with Real Estate Millionaires. I think it came out three, maybe four weeks ago. Uh, that's basically 15 conversations with other real estate investors, right? My story is very buy and hold. Uh, but I've been out of the out of the rat race for three years now, and I've been lucky enough to interview 15 other amazing people. So that became the second book. Some people burr, uh, some people do uh, Airbnb, some people do apartments. There's just so many ways in real estate. So yeah, I actually just released my second book, 15 Conversations with Real Estate Millionaires. So check it out. Absolutely. Is that on Amazon? It is. Yeah. I just, Amazon's my publisher. I'm, I'm lazy. So Amazon's my <laughs> publisher. Uh, not yet. I do have somebody committed to recording it. It just takes a while. Audible is very um, expensive and picky. Uh, so it will eventually be there, but I, it's in all honesty, it's probably six months out. It's, it's, it's a, it's a hard task. So I, I know you in the book, uh, your first book, you mentioned mm -hmm. that you currently help W2 employees with looking to get their first rental properties. How has that business been going? It was wonderful. Yeah, that was something I did right after releasing the book. Uh, we did uh, 57 of those. It's something I call, we turned slumlord properties into pride of ownership uh, and we sold them to others. It was an amazing business. Uh, just the last two years, it's been tough to find deals. Uh, so we haven't done a new deal. We did one triplex last year, but that was it. Uh, actually, a triplex in a house that so we did two deals last year. It's really tough. Uh, and actually, this year, 2022, I'm not selling anything. Uh, it's, it's, it's so hard to find deals today, guys, uh, that I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep them all. But yeah, we did 57 and got, you know, I think we had several repeat buyers, but probably 35 or 40 people we helped get their first property. It's, it's kind of a cool feeling. So, so with you said, it's so hard to find a deal, which is absolutely true. How do you recommend an employee today get into the, the rental real estate space? Well, the first thing you got to do is you got to remember that learning that real estate investing, I think is a skill. Nobody's born with it. It can be learned. Uh, I talk about focus and daily discipline, establishing your buy box. I believe everybody, before you write an offer, should learn your buy box and figure out what an average deal is. That takes the best of them 60 days. It takes most of them 90 days. And then at that point, during those 90 days, you're also growing your network. You're telling people what you're looking for. And it just takes time. So I still look at the MLS every day. My entire portfolio that I retired on was out of the MLS. Since I've left work, I've probably done half my deals in the MLS, half off market. Uh, some wholesalers, some 
past relationships, but uh, it all starts with understanding what an average deal is. And most people, most people don't want to do the work. Most people are like, I want a deal. I want a deal. I'm like, well, do you know what a deal is? No, but you can tell me. I'm like, why would you trust me? Go learn your deal. Go learn your market. Uh, do the work. Um, lots of people are excited by financial independence. Not a lot of people want to do the work, though. It's it's kind of a it's 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 a very sexy message. It is absolutely possible, but unfortunately, uh, it takes work and it takes time, and not everybody wants to hear that. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Um, yeah, like you said, in this world that we currently live in, there's a lot of delayed gratification that people don't want to do. Um, do you still currently help employees look for rental properties and stuff like that or commercial properties? Yeah, I certainly help. I help people learn their market today. Uh, like I talked about earlier, we actually did. We actually bought 57 just trash, dumpy properties, remodeled them and sold them to people to start. We don't do that anymore. But I do teach people how to do it. Yeah, thousands of people are, are in my course called How to Get Started One Rental at a Time. It's basically one rental at a time. The book we've talked about is our story. The course is how I did it, right? Learn yield, learn average, grow your network. Uh, and then because the channel is so big, we have other experts uh, like the Lumberjack Landlord, Dion from Dion Talk, all these other people, uh, Anna, REI Mom, adding extra content to help people. So, yeah, we're, we're, we give it away for just a ridiculously cheap price, but uh, yeah, thousands of people, a couple of thousand. Now. So when you were first on uh, real estate, mm -hmm. you were primarily in the, was it Fresno? Only Fresno, still. Only Fresno? So you're still only Fresno. Yeah, I don't want to learn a new market. You can't compare Fresno with Texas and Fresno with Miami. I believe even myself, if I was going to go to Texas, I'd have to invest 90 days. I'd have to build a brand new team. I have to make mistakes all over again. I have zero interest in any of that. Uh, I'm going to stay in my network. I'm going to grow a little bit every year. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that. I don't, I don't have to have a thousand units. I don't have to have five. Shoot, I don't have to have 200 units. We're good. I don't have this ego that says I got to be the biggest or the best or the baddest. I have a very simple lifestyle. I'm lucky enough to have my bills paid by what I've done. And I'm okay with that. Did, did you ever bring in any other family members besides your wife into the real estate investing game? That's a great question. Uh, so we so we have a daughter. Uh, we tried to get her involved. Unfortunately, when she was old enough to figure it out, it was 2010, 11, 12. And we were buying dumpy properties, right? This is the foreclosure time frame. So the mistake I made then, and don't do this, don't bring your kids to dumps. Bring them to the after, not the before. Uh, we brought her to some really <laughs> trash units, and she's like, "I don't want any of that. That thing's got bugs, and you know, that, don't, I, I'm not going in there." Uh, so yeah, don't do that. Um, I, then we've had some other family, so didn't really get our daughter on board, and we've had other family members kind of poke at it because you know we live a pretty good life now. Uh, but again, don't want to do the work. And again, I've told them, I've given them very like simple things. And they're like, you just tell me, you just tell me. I'm like, I, no, I'm not going to just, no, sorry. Do the work. Do, do the work just like everybody else. Did, uh, did you ever have any issues obtaining capital for your deals besides your W2? Like you said, you took out 401k loans, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have to go to a hard money lender or? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I mean, I did everything. The, the beauty of looking at your market every day is you, you find a way. So, so it's probably 2010. The market's probably off 50% at this point in my market. So things are getting good, but they get better. But I don't know that, right? I'm like, wow, honey, the deals are everywhere. So we go to Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo has our money, right? Has our savings, our checking account. I've been with them for 30 years. Um, 800 credit score, uh, six-figure income, seven-figure net worth at this point. And I want to buy an 80K house. And I'm willing to put 25% down. So 20 grand. Uh, our portfolio is probably 90 units at the time. And I go to Wells Fargo, my private banker, and I say, I want to buy this house. Here's, here's the purchase contract. I want a loan. And he turns white. I'm like, are you okay? What, what, what's, hmm. that's, that's an interesting reaction. <laughs> He goes, Michael, I hate to tell you this, but we are no longer doing investor loans. If you have more than four units, we can't lend to you no matter what. 
And I'm like, wait a minute, right? This is now 2012. We're long past the, the crash. Never missed a payment. Uh, you got all my money. You can see I can pay cash for this if I had to. What do you mean you're not giving me a loan? He's like, real estate investors are the problem and we're not lending for them. I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> okay. All right. I see how you are. So I literally walk across the street in my city. Wells Fargo's here. Bank of America's here. I walk into Bank of America. They don't know me from Adam, right? Because I never had a relationship. Why would they? Wells Fargo's got my money. But I walk into Bank of America. I tell them who I am. I tell them I'm willing to transfer all my stuff to them if they're willing to help me out. And they don't politely explain to me. They damn near cuss me out of the building saying, real estate investors are the devil. We just bought countrywide, blah, 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 blah. You're the evil, you know, just nasty stuff. I'm like, holy shit, there's something going on. Uh, so again, I wanted this deal and we ended up going to a hard money lender in San Mateo. Uh, I think he charged us 12 points. He made us put down 35% of purchase. And uh, I think so 12% interest, three points and 35% um, down. So uh, it allowed us to grow, uh, but not as fast as I wanted. And then we, we did we did about eight, maybe 10 loans with him. So about a million, about a million one, I think. And then, uh, then we found private money. Private money was a godsend. We didn't have to pay points. We paid 10% instead of 12. Uh, and they came in for the entire purchase price. Uh, and that was right around 2012. So we, from 10 to 12, all hard money, just crazy rates. And then from uh, 12 to 14, 15-ish was all private money. So yeah, it's access to money, man. Access to capital is important. Have you ever had a bad experience with a hard money lender? Well, I would, I would say paying three points, 12%, 35% down is a bad experience. <laughs> Uh, we, we've had, we had one that was short term. Uh, we had to move. That was uncomfortable. We needed, it felt like we paid for that loan twice. Um, it was partly my fault, not understanding the paper was short. Uh, it was 18 months, I think. And I thought, I thought it was five years with an 18 month option, but I don't know, whatever, made a mistake. Uh, but we were able to get through that. For those who don't know, how does uh, a hard money lender usually work? Well, hard money lenders basically are people, generally speaking, investing their own capital, right? And they're, they're, basically, um, they're basically the loan sharks of, uh, of, of lending. Highest rates, usually lending not on the borrower, me, but on the asset. Because basically what a hard money lender wants to do is they want to know worst case if you default, they can take back the property and get a discount. Hence, they wanted me to put 35% down. They want a huge margin of safety. Uh, and, the, and, you know, after I created a relationship, this guy's now my friend. He actually says that he expects 20% of his loans to default. And then he's going to go get a 35% discount on some property. So uh, it's actually part of their business. Uh, but, yeah, they're very, very, um, they charge a lot. They, their whole job is to turn money. They're making about 1% a month, right? 12%, 1% a month. You got you got 100 million bucks. You're making 1% a month. That's a million bucks. So uh, they're, they're doing okay. Has your network grown a lot since you released your first and now your second book coming out? Yeah, thankfully. Yeah. Uh, my network was pretty decent because I'd been building for 15 years, but uh, my national and even worldwide um name one rental at a time means a lot more people reaching out to me all the time. Um, writing a book that's been well received has been, been pretty awesome. So, uh, and I, if anybody wants to reach out one rental at a time on Instagram, I, I, I'm a one man show. So if somebody replies, it's me. It's not some VA in the Philippines or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so funny you mentioned that. Would you recommend that people use a virtual assistant if they get big enough? Um, especially in the Philippines, because I know that is a well-known topic to talk about. Yeah, I think VAs do a lot of work. It's, it's hard for me to say that, given that where I'm at, I've never used them. Uh, but again, I, I think there's a lot of great reasons to use VAs, right? Costa Rica, uh, Philippines, if, as long as they're English speaking, uh, it's, it's, you can really replenish, right? I, 
the, the problem I have sitting here today is I consider myself an investor. Lots of people who use VAs are entrepreneurs and business owners, right? That they're trying to create systems and processes and trying to duplicate themselves. Dude, I'm just having a good time, <laughs> right? I'm talking to you guys for 45 minutes. I'm going to go out after this and go have dinner with the wife. You know, th this is all good. Stuff, so, um, but yeah, if you're running a business and you, and you're getting to a point where you want to outsource different tasks, virtual assistants are, um, I, I, they can do, they can do wonders for you. Yeah. Were you and your wife, the only ones who were kind of, you know, when you had a lot of tenants coming through doing the turnover of the properties, cleaning them yourselves? No, see, the beauty is we live two and a half hours away. So we had property managers since day one. So every deal we did had to support 10% property management fee. So we didn't deal with any of that. In fairness, we did one time, we went just to prove we could paint units. What an utter disaster that was. Um, but yeah, no, we pay property management. We don't self-manage, we never manage. We don't want people to know who we are. Um, yeah, so we pay property manage. So we don't do any of that. We, we worked out with our property manager, what's the criteria? to say yes to a tenant. Uh, we have processes to get stuff approved. If it's below 50 bucks, don't bother me. Uh, if it's above 200 bucks, I want pictures. Uh, you know, just, we set up the system and processes. So uh, no, we don't do any of that and, and never have, frankly. So, so with a lot of people not knowing how to get into to rental real estate, would you just say knowing your market is the best first step to kind of get you to that area and building out a team? Uh, yeah. So I think, I think the first thing, most real estate investors, I'm actually, actually in the office I'm in now, I'm having a sign made with my seven rules. Rule number one is focus. Too many people watching this and others like it are all over the map. I want to wholesale. I want to flip. I want to buy and hold. I want apartments. I want to lend. I want this. I want that. I want an Airbnb. Slow down. Pick your lane. Study your lane. You know, I, I did buy and hold for 15 years before I flipped a property. You know, especially if you work full time, you don't have the ability to learn buy and hold and flipping and Airbnb. All of those things are different. All of them have their own processes and procedures. All of them can make you wildly successful, but they all can burn you as well. So if you have a day job and you have a family like we did, pick one. Go learn that. And then when you pick your thing, whatever it is, I suggest learning what a good deal is. And that doesn't start with learning a good deal. It actually starts with learning average. So rule number two of seven is daily discipline. You got to look at your buy box every day. I looked at my buy box every day for almost 21 years straight. I'm, you know, some years like 2020, it's impossible. 2021, it's okay. Six deals. So it just takes practice. You got to, you got to. You got to meet new people every week. That's the big thing. If I had to do it again, I didn't start growing my network on purpose until year five. If I had to do it again, I would try to meet two new people a week. That means you know 100 people at the end of one year. It means you know two people at the end of two years. That was a big mistake I made. I, I would be bigger today if I'd met people earlier. Uh, is, is it possible to hear any of the rest of the rules out of your seven? Uh, I can get them. <laughs> So number three is grow your network. Meet two people, meet two new people a week. Number four, learn average deal first. Only good or great deals after. Number five, bad things will happen. Sorry, learn from them and move on. Six, five to 10 year commitment. Get rich for sure, not quick. And number seven, and perhaps my favorite, is audit your personal network. Are they helping you or hurting you? Ooh, so those like are the, that last so, one. Yeah, that's my favorite. Too many yeah. people, they just stay around the same people doing the same shit. Yeah. You know, if your buddies are playing video games and smoking weed, you're going to be playing video games and smoking weed. Go get some new friends. Yeah, I, I think that last one is, you know, a lot of people might not do that. And that's, I think that can be like such a great killer to your wealth. Oh yeah, if you don't if you do the first six and not the seventh, that's why it's my favorite. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If you don't audit your network. And oh by the way, let's be clear. My network has changed probably four times in 20 years. Right? When I had six or seven units, I had one circle of friends. 
You get to 80 units, you have a different circle. You get to more than that, you get financially free. You're, you should always be auditing your network. Yeah, I feel like that's a perfect um, what to live by because some people get stuck with trying to be loyal to certain people, but you know sometimes you just outgrow those people at certain points in your life. They're either your helping business. you or hurting you. It's that simple. Now, with all of the real estate you've accumulated over the years, um, should, you know, everyone dies at some point, will your daughter continue your journey for you, or do you think she would liquidate all your assets? Uh, so, no, she would likely sell. In fact, we have trust and wills and all the things put together. Yeah, I would assume that she would... Um, she would be very liquid inside of 12 months. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's so true. Like, I, I just think a, a lot, like, those seven rules that you gave are are really the rules to live by, essentially. Uh, you know, yeah, I, they, they're going to be front and center in my office, the first thing you see when you open the front door. <laughs> yeah. We agree. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for coming on the show today. We appreciate your time. This has been Life, Love, and Pursuit of Fi. I'm your host, Greg. And I'm your host, Austin. Thank you for coming. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you, Michael. Take care.